Hey everyone, this is Dave from the Adobe Character Animator team. And if you've never used Adobe Character Animator before, this is the tutorial for you. We're gonna get started by setting up your camera and microphone and then using that to animate a performance capture character in real time using your own face and voice. Then we'll take a quick tour of some of the aspects of the app where the triggers panel is, the timeline, project panel, behaviors, rig mode, all of that stuff. So you have a general idea of the lay of the land and how to get around to different things. Then we'll do a short recording. We'll show you how to record a performance and then how to edit it later if you want to change certain things, uh, fix mistakes, all of that. Finally, we'll export out a video or teach you how to bring your character animations into other Adobe apps like Premiere Pro and After Effects for further work. Uh, by the end of this, hopefully you'll have a great overview of everything the character animator is capable of. So if that sounds good to you, let's get started. When you first open up Character Animator, you're gonna be taken to the home screen. And this has a ton of great resources and interactive tutorial that'll teach you the basics, a um, puppet maker, make your own puppet thing, uh, video tutorials, tons of example puppets. You can use all of these royalty free however you want, but let's get started with just the basics and create a blank new project. So to do that, I'm gonna go over here to the left-hand side and click on the new project button. And I can just set the default, call this whatever I want, save it wherever I want, but I'm just gonna go with the default name and location and click save. All right, so if you've done that correctly, you should now have a blank project with absolutely nothing in it except your own face in the webcam in the upper right corner. So you should see your face as well as an audio meter that's going up and down as you're talking. If you're not seeing that, let's do some quick troubleshooting. Number one, if you have any other programs that are using a webcam, make sure to close them. So Zoom, Microsoft Teams, anything like that, close it. They can compete with uh, the webcam and Character Animator and make it inaccessible. Number two, make sure that these icons for the webcam and the microphone are both turned on and blue. That means they're active and ready to go. Don't worry about this one in the middle yet. That's for body tracking. We'll get to that a little bit later. If you have multiple webcams on your computer or the right wrong one is showing up or something like that, you can click on the menu icon next to camera and microphone and select multiple webcams. So if you have another USB cam or a virtual camera or something like that, it should show up in this list over here. Finally, if the microphone isn't working and you're not seeing a signal over here, you may wanna turn up your OS uh, recording settings to make sure the input volume is high enough. Or also you can go into character preferences on Mac, or that's edit preferences on Windows. And the very first thing that's gonna come up is your audio hardware preferences, and you can select whatever you want your default input to be and adjust any settings as need be. So now that we know that our basic tools of our voice and our face are ready to go, let's go get a character and bring it in to this project. So when I created a new project, it took me to the record workspace automatically, but I can go back to the home workspace by just clicking the little home icon up here in the upper left corner. And now I'm back at the beginning. So what is a puppet file? Well, a puppet is anything with a .puppet extension, and it's a special format we have in Character Animator that packages together a few things. Number one, the original artwork, so usually an Adobe Photoshop or Illustrator file, all the layers, all the art information, plus the rigging information that you do in Character Animator. So that includes like, how do the elbows bend? Which way, how fast do the pupils move? Can the character jump or walk? Or all of that sort of stuff is embedded in that .puppet file. So it's the artwork file plus all this extra information that Character Animator needs to understand how it works. And there are a ton of ways to get puppets into Character Animator. You can click on one of these puppets. You can click see more to find more online um, from the Adobe site or from other third party creators. And you can always bring in a puppet by going to file, import into your character animator project. One really fun new feature we've added is this thing called Puppet Maker. If you were to click on this, that's gonna take you into a nice streamlined puppet creation system where you can select a style of character. So more hand-drawn, more 3D, more anime, whatever you want. And then you can choose uh, different you know, hairstyles and hair colors and props and all of that to really quickly create a custom character. Um, you can also press the randomize button to quickly get a sense of everything that's possible um, with this. And then once you're happy with how your character is looking, you could click the generate button and that's going to bring your character into a new composition. 
For the purposes of learning today, we're gonna to start with a pre-made character, but after you learn the basics, I would definitely come back here and try something with one of these custom characters. So I'm just gonna close this window to get back to the home screen. For today though, let's get started with a really simple, easy to learn character, and that's gonna be Chloe. Uh, right here on the upper left of the free puppets, example puppets. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on her and immediately I should see this character show up in record mode uh, and start moving to my own movements. So as I blink, as I look around with my pupils, as I talk, um, as I move my head back and forth, as I raise and lower my eyebrows, the character should be doing the same. This is all in the behind the scenes rigging information of Chloe that we're not really gonna get into in this tutorial. There's a whole other rigging tutorial that I'm planning to do for all of that. But for now, we just know she is acting and moving around with our different motions. Now, before you get started with anything, you want to calibrate your character. So the way you would do that is look at your character directly and then click this button over here next under the webcam called Calibrate. That's gonna recenter your character and you should see these green tracking lines uh, appear all over your face. Basically, this is resetting your character to kind of their zero, zero position. This is where they're gonna start from. So if you feel your character is, you know, a little bit off center or you're getting in a different position, all you wanna do is, you know, get yourself in the most comfortable position possible. Where are you gonna start from? Look at your character and go ahead and click calibrate. And then that's going to be your new center starting position. So we've talked about moving the head and the eyes and all that stuff. What about the arms? So you have a few options with a character like Chloe. Number one is you can use the mouse or fingers on a touch enabled device to move the arms and drag them around. And because she has something called limb IK set up on her, her elbows should automatically bend in the correct way as you do this. Um, this is great and it gives you a lot of precision of you know where specifically you want an arm to be. Um, and But you can only do one at a time, right, if you're using a mouse. And so that's a little bit of a limitation, but there are some ways around that that we'll talk about later. But Chloe actually has another way to do things as well, and that's body tracking. So this is another option you have at your disposal. So let's go ahead and refresh the scene down here, this little refresh icon. That's gonna reset our character back to her original position. And that way I'm not, I know that, you know, all these movements that I did with the arms aren't going to show up and compete with uh, what I'm about to do. So click refresh, get her back into that position. And now what I can do is I can see that over here in the behaviors, I notice there's a behavior here called body. If you see a character with a body behavior, that means that they are able to do body tracking in some capacity. So if I go ahead and click on the body tracker icon here, now I'm going to see that these little things are appearing on my shoulders. And if I were to move my arms around, uh, I'm gonna get some things on there as well, some tracking lines and dots. Now, you. If you're gonna to try to track sitting down, you're not never gonna get the full expressiveness that you want. So for body tracking, particularly upper torso body tracking, we recommend putting your chair away, moving your camera, and making sure you have enough room in your webcam to see your half torso, at least the upper part of your torso, in an A position. So putting your arms out like this. Now to calibrate now, because it's body tracking, we need a little bit of extra time to step back. So you can go ahead and click the calibrate button. It's gonna give you a five second countdown. You can put your arms in this A position like this, and now your character is ready for body tracking. So now if I wave with my hand, or I you know, put my hands on my hips, or do various gestures, the character is going to be doing the same. So dragging the arms around with the mouse or uh, using body tracking, these are both valid ways to control your character. Why would you use one or the other? Well, really it's a personal preference, right? Um, for this purposes, this tutorial, we're primarily gonna be using the dragger um, because that gives us a little bit more precision and a little bit easier to edit um, later on in our timeline. But body tracking is a lot of fun. So particularly if you're doing a live stream or something like that, it's fun to just play around with and be able to you know, dance with your character or whatever. So play around with them if the character supports it and see what works best for you. And some characters actually have full body tracking and Chloe is one of those examples. So actually, if I got all the way back and moved around, I could do some dancing and moving and she is going to uh, move along with those different movements and I can play around with something like that. 
But if you're not using body tracking, you can go ahead and turn that off. Um, and if the character does not have a body behavior, by the way, this won't even let you turn it on. It'll give you a little warning message that uh, body is not enabled. So that will help you as well. All right, so now we have a basic character up and running, right? We have know the basics. We know how to calibrate our character. We know that our webcam is on. We know the difference between body tracking and dragging the arms around, um, all of that stuff. So now that we got this basic character up, let's go through a tour of the rest of the interface and understand what all these different parts of character emitter are and how they work. All right, so we already talked a little bit about switching between workspaces. And for your purposes, you're probably just gonna switch between these two, the home screen and the record screen. If you wanted to get into rigging, which will be covered in other tutorials, you would go into rig mode here. And just to give you a basic overview, this is where you would import your Photoshop or Illustrator artwork and uh, the layers all would appear over here in the left. And then rigging information like where the elbow is or what aspects are draggable or what parts are more rigid than others show up here. Um, you don't have to worry about it. Rigging can be a very complicated process and we're not gonna dig into it here, but if you are interested in making your own characters, just know Character Animator allows for any Photoshop or Illustrator file to be animated through Performance Capture. And so um, that's a whole other tutorial though. Now I also have stream mode over here, and this is a special version optimized for live streaming. One of the great aspects of Character Animator is that you can do live streaming uh, through it. So if you ever wanted to do, you know, an Ask a Cartoon Character Q&A or do a cartoon, you know, uh, talk show or something like that on Twitch or YouTube or Instagram or TikTok or wherever, Character Animator allows you to do that sort of stuff. We have some live streaming tutorials on the channel that will teach you more about that if you're interested in it. And if you are, this is a pretty good interface for doing that sort of thing. It gets rid of the timeline um, and just focuses on your character and some of the main controls that you would need. But for the purposes of this tutorial, we're gonna primarily stay in the record workspace. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on that again. So directly under the workspaces is your project panel. And here you're going to see any assets that you've imported to using Character Animator. That could be puppet files, that could be audio files, uh, JPEG, background art, anything like that is going to show up here and it's referenced. So you wanna make sure it's saved on your local computer. We highly recommend keeping files uh, saved on your local drive as opposed to a cloud back drive like Dropbox or something like that because those can sometimes run into syncing issues that can mess up your project. But all of them should be referenced up here. If I wanted to add more stuff into here, I can either go to file import and it will show up or I can double click in any blank space and I'm going to get uh, a file browser that allows me to pick stuff as well. So I have two things in my project panel right now. It says I have a puppet file called Chloe Photoshop and a scene called scene Chloe Photoshop. So the puppet, if I double click on this, it's gonna take me as a shortcut to rig mode. It's basically saying, you know, oh, you wanna alter the puppet somehow, you wanna do stuff with it, I'm gonna switch you to rig mode. Whereas if I double click on a scene, that's gonna take me to record mode. And it's saying, okay, now you're ready to put your character into a world, into a timeline, record some stuff, and create a story. So the relationship between these is you can have as many puppets referenced in a scene as you want. So if I took Chloe here and just dragged another version of her into the scene, you'll see I now have two Chloes on my timeline and whichever one I have selected is the one that I'm currently moving. If I wanted to move them around, I could go over select one and then go to the transform behavior over here on the right hand side and slide the little values for position X or Y or scale or whatever you want to position that character uh, as you want. And then you can select the other one in the timeline and do the same thing for them. And that's a way that you could have two characters in the same scene. Now you can only record one at a time, right? Well, actually you could shift select both of them and have them both move at the same time if you wanted to. That's gonna be a really boring conversation between two characters though. So typically what you do is you would have one character talking and then you move to the other character and you kind of record them piece by piece. We'll get to this stuff in a little bit, but for now, just so you know, a puppet is, you know, a scene is just as many references of puppets as you want. And I could keep dragging and importing more puppets. It could be different characters. I could have Chloe and a unicorn and a frog all in the same scene talking to each other. And that's totally fine. Now, if you don't see a scene, for example, I'm just gonna select my scene and press delete. Now, uh, if I wanted to create a new scene with a puppet, add a puppet to a new timeline and, and scene, all I have to do is select it 
and click on this little icon down here, the little clapboard icon, add to new scene. And that's gonna go ahead and make a new scene with that character selected. Now, if I select these objects, I'm gonna see some information about them in the properties here on the right-hand side. So here, I can see Chloe, I can see what artwork file, what's the PSD that she's uh, referencing, her auto-sync with artwork, all of her different behaviors over here, things like that. For the scene, if I select that, and go over here, now I can see a bunch of information about this particular scene. I see the frame rate, I see how long it's going to be, and I see the width and height. So if I wanted to change this, for example, to a square version of uh, this, and maybe I want it to run at only 12 frames per second, and I want it to happen for you know 15 seconds, I can do all that information over here, and it's gonna let me set up my scene for whatever format um, in any setting I want. Next up is the history panel. So tabbed over here next to project is history. And this is gonna show you every step that you've taken for this particular project. And so if I wanted to change all those scene settings that I just did, I could of course undo it, edit, undo, um, you know, all those different steps, or I could just go back and click uh, several steps back to go back in my history. Character Animator is automatically gonna save every step you take in your history. So you never have to manually save. It should automatically save everything for you. And if you do make a mistake and need to go back, just go to your history panel and find the correct thing and go ahead and uh, select it and it will take you back to that previous state. Typically, I don't have the history panel open very often. It's there, nice to have as an option, but typically I have project panel is the main thing that I have in focus at all times. Next up, under the project and history panel, we have triggers and controls. And if you're not seeing anything, that's because you don't have a puppet selected. So the best way to do this is look in the timeline below, single click, select your character, your puppet, and you should see some stuff showing up here if it has been enabled for the puppet. So again, not every puppet may have these controls or triggers, and that's okay. But if they do, what these allow you to do is really quickly add some interesting uh, additional things your character can do. So for example, if I click this right here, it's gonna change my character's hand to a pointing uh, hand instead of the default. And if I click it again, it's gonna go back to that default. Um, same thing with the eyes over here. If I click this, her eyes are going to open up and be wide and her eyelids are gonna disappear. And if I click on it again, it's gonna go back to its default state. Here's a mouth that's a more sad looking mouth and uh, a blink. Uh, I can hold this down, and then a bunch of like arm motions and animations. So these are some pre-made uh, things that her arms can do, so I don't have to worry about dragging them or doing body tracking or anything like that um, if I wanted. So the controls area is a visual layout of triggers, and this is a way uh, that an artist, a puppet creator, can set up to make triggers really easily accessible to people. But behind the scenes where this is all happening is in the triggers panel. And so you can see in here, here are all the possible triggers that this character has. So I can see the blink is here, and even though I don't have a button, I see in the left side here, it says B. So if I were to press the B key, the character is going to blink. and it's gonna have a blinking you know, whenever I press it. Over here with the left hand, I see there's a group that has these three little dots and then it says flip, default, and point. So default is whatever's gonna show up just by default. So right now her hand positions are set in their default position. But if I were to press one, then that's gonna flip her hand around, have the thumb go the other way. If I were to press, press two, that's gonna do that point. And so, I have this, What these are called a swap set. This is when you want uh, only one thing to show up at a time, right? We would not want all three of these hands to show up at once. We only want one at a time. So we want the palm this way, palm this way, or a point. And that's what a swap set does. And so when you're first learning about a new puppet, it's worth it to go through their triggers list and just click and see, okay, like what's three do? What does four do? You know, try all the different buttons and see how they all um, work and act. And then you'll kind of get a sense of the range of your character. What emotions do they have? What are all the possibilities of what you can do with them? One thing to note is that certain triggers are what we call latched. And if it has a filled in square over here, that means that it's a latch trigger. So if I press one, her hand is going to stay in that flipped position until I press one again, or were to click the button again in the controls panel. Whereas blink, that is not filled in. And so if I press B, 
It's only going to happen as I'm actually holding down the key. And when I let go, it's going to automatically go off. And this is just a setup um, that the, the author of the puppet will create. You can change this by selecting any trigger. And if latch is not selected, you can check it and it will be or vice versa. If it is and it's checked, you can turn it off. Typically, it, for quicker triggers, you typically see that you, like a blink, you typically see that they are not latched, so it's just a quick press um, that you would do. And for saying that you actually want to hold for a few seconds or, or longer, that's probably going to be a latch trigger. All right, so that's triggers and controls, and under that we have the timeline. This is where anything you record is going to show up, and this is honestly where you're going to be spending the bulk of your time doing things in a character animator recording session. Right now it's kind of boring because it's blank, but let's add a few things. For example, let's add a background to this character, right? So uh, Chloe's here, but she's kind of standing in a white void. I could change the background color actually by clicking this little color uh, square over here, and that gives me a few different options um, to change colors. But if I were to export this out as a video, it's just going to show up as a black background. This is just kind of a reference for me to see. So ideally, I want some sort of image or background uh, behind her. So what I'm going to do is go to my project panel, and just like we talked about before, I'm going to go to File, Import, and I'm gonna find a background on my computer. So let's say I've got this nice forest one that I'll use. So I'll select that, just a normal JPEG file, click import, and now I should see BG Forest, that file, shows up in my panel. Now it's being classified as a puppet. Is this background really a puppet? Well, no, it's not gonna have face movement and all of that stuff, but it is considered another element in our scene, and anything like that is gonna be considered a puppet. So to bring this into our scene, it's really easy. We're just going to click and drag it, and drag it into the scene panel over here. And it's gonna completely cover up my character. I probably don't want that, so I'm gonna go into my timeline here and I see that my forest is on top of Chloe. So instead, I'm gonna click and drag and bring forest under Chloe, and now I have her set up correctly. Now right now, she's not moving around because I have the forest selected instead of Chloe. So if I wanted to control her, I'm going to select her, and now I'm moving her around instead. So I could have as many elements down here in the timeline as I want. I could have multiple characters, foreground elements, background stuff, whatever I want um, to make up a scene. But the typical uh, character animator scene is exactly like this. I have a character uh, that is above a background image of some sorts. Now, if my background was too big or too small or I wanted to resize it a little bit, I can select it and then go over here to my behaviors on the right. And just like we did when we were moving a character around earlier, I can look at the transform behavior and say, okay, I wanna scale this up or down or reposition it, you know, left or right or whatever um, to get it exactly in the right uh, orientation. But let's go ahead and select Chloe and look at her behaviors. Basically, behaviors are like the brains of a character. It's teaching how, character animator how to make each of these things work. So transform is a really easy one, right? It's just basic position and scale and rotation type of stuff. So if I have Chloe selected and change position Y or position X, I'm just dragging, clicking and dragging over the values here or scale or rotation, I can change all these different values of her and how she sh shows up. And if I wanna go back to the defaults that the author originally set, I can just click the X's here next to each value that I've changed and that's gonna take me back to whatever the author originally set up. So maybe I want more of a close-up shot for Chloe here, and so I would scale her up a little bit and change position Y, so I'm just seeing you know, the upper part of her torso. Now you may notice as I'm moving my head back and forth that Chloe has physics that are affecting her hair, right? As she moves around, there's kind of a little bit of a bounce to her hair. These are secondary animations that an artist can set up to add a little bit of extra bounce or uh, motion to a character. And that's done through the physics behavior here. So I have a bunch of different options that I could dig into if I wanted to. So for example, stiffness right now is at 100, but if I change that down lower, the stiffness is gonna be much looser, and now her hair is gonna be much more flowy. Now, it's not gonna look that great. This is not how the author originally intended this puppet to look, so I'm gonna click the X to bring her back to her original setting, but you can understand how playing with any of these parameters can have a dramatic effect on how your character is going to animate. Now, you'll notice that these behaviors have red dots next to them. What a red dot means is it is armed. It is Think of red as meaning ready, ready to record. So anything with a red dot 
means it's on and, and looking for live data. So for example, if I turned off the face uh, uh, arming icon here, now when I move my face around, it's not tracking that anymore. Same thing with lip sync. If I turn that off, well, now the mouth isn't moving anymore. If I turn them back on, now I'll get lip sync back and now I'll get the face movements back. Now you might notice that some of these have smaller dots. So in Chloe, we've got transform, physics, and limb IK. They're kind of these smaller, more dim dots. And that's what we call passive behaviors. These are behaviors that happen in the background. So like position changes or scale changes or the physics, all of those are just things that are happening. She's in this position. The physics are happening. There is gravity. Uh, her limbs are moving with elbow bends where, as expected. Those are not things you have to arm or disarm for recording. They just happen in the background. So when you see that little dot, it just means that's a passive behavior. The ones you want to worry about are the ones that are the big dots. Now you can turn all of these on or off at the same time by holding down Command on Mac or Control on Windows and clicking one of them. And that's going to arm or disarm everything at once. So sometimes it's helpful to say, all right, I'm gonna command click and disarm everything and just focus on the face or uh, command click and bring everything back on. So with any character, it's worth it to play around with the settings and get things working as you want. Um, you can spend a lot of time digging in and trying different things. One of the most uh, easy ones to get started with is the face behavior. So if I twirl that open, I see a bunch of different options down here. For example, head tilt strength. How strong is the tilt going to be when I tilt my head back and forth? If I make this a little bit higher, then when I tilt, she's gonna have much stronger tilt uh, to her face. Whereas if I turn this a little bit lower, then it's not gonna tilt as much. That kind of is combined with position strength, which is gonna change how much my head movement is gonna change the position of where the character is, and I can make that higher or lower as well. So you can really turn it up to be as, you know, uh, one one to your own actions or make it a little bit more subtle and scaled back. Um, and so you play around with these and get them exactly like you want. Now again, the author is gonna set their defaults and what they think is the best for you, but you have full control after importing a puppet to do whatever you want. And these changes are not saved onto the puppet itself. So you can make changes and it's only gonna affect the puppet in this particular scene. That original puppet file is still gonna have those factory default settings of whatever the uh, author originally intended. So feel free to play around with it and have fun. And in a worst case scenario, you can always re-import the puppet um, and try again uh, if you had to, but don't worry about it. This is all about experimentation and try new things out and getting the quality of animation that you want. So really quick, let's just do a simple recording. So I see that I have everything armed over here. I have Chloe selected in the timeline and I'm just gonna press the red record button and just talk for uh, you know a few seconds. So let me get her arms in a good position and let's just press record. Hey everybody, I'm Chloe. I used to be a static Photoshop file. It was boring, lifeless, not that fun. But then I was brought into Adobe Character Animator and now I can move and talk and look around and all sorts of different things. So life is much better as a character animator puppet. All right, bye. And then I just press the record button again to stop or you can press space bar. So what did that do? It basically recorded a live performance. Everything that had a red dot here and that saw data changing, like a voice or arms moving or the eyes moving, is going to get a track in the timeline down here. So if I you know, go through this, I see I've got my audio file up here, my voice. I see I have my dragger, which is the dragging of the hands moving around. I see eye gaze, that's my eye positioning. Face was my head movements, lip sync, is all the different mouth shapes that this character has, and then the forest uh, background, which I didn't do anything to. Now, the visims, uh, visims means visual mouth shapes, basically, and that's what most character animator uh, characters are set up as. They have a lot of different mouth shapes. So if I zoom in on this, and I can do that using this nice little slider down here in the right uh, corner, which will let me zoom in or out of the timeline, I can see that every mouth shape is showing up here in the timeline. Um, if I want to get a accurate portrayal of what I recorded and not seeing this live data like I'm seeing right now, all I have to do is click the red dot next to Chloe. So anytime after I record something um, and I, I want to look at my recording and play around with it, 
Typically what I'll do is click the red dot next to it so I'm only seeing recorded data. I'm not seeing any live data coming in and polluting you know, what I'm seeing in the timeline. And now as I get close, I can see you know, really quick all the things that I did, including every mouth shape that she said down here. So I see where it changes from A ah to D to W to D, uh, you know, back and forth. And all this is just happening automatically. And that is awesome. That just is something I don't even have to worry about, right? I, I can just talk naturally, act naturally, and my character is going to create a compelling performance from it. Okay, so that's the fast and easy way to do recording. Let's say you wanna go in a little bit deeper though and do things step by step. So I'm just gonna select these things in my timeline and press delete um, to get rid of them. Same with the audio. So now I just have Chloe and the forest as the only things. Now I could just record the audio first. Typically when you're doing an animation like this, you always wanna start with audio because everything else is dependent off the audio. When you do certain poses or emotions or mannerisms is really dependent off of the audio. So usually I start with that. And so the way I would do that is let me press command and click these red dots, uh, command click on Mac, control click on Windows to turn them all off. And then I'm just going to do lip sync. And so right now I'm only going to do the lip sync performance and I could press record and as I start talking, it is only going to do the lip sync recording. So right now, as I'm talking, the only thing that's getting recorded is the mouth shapes and the actual audio file, uh, the waveform that's showing up top. And when I press the space bar to stop, that is the only thing that's going to show up. So that's one method to do the voice. But you may want to do your voice recording in another program. Maybe there's an audio program like Adobe Audition that you're recording your voice in, you record it on your phone, or you have a friend whose voice you're using. I probably don't wanna do the female voice for this character. I probably want to get a friend to do it and send me that audio file, an MP3, WAV file, AIF file, whatever. And so you can actually do the voice from external recordings as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and delete this waveform that I created as well as this lip sync and I'm going to do um, a different type instead. So I'm gonna import an audio file by going to file, import, and then I have this audio file that a friend sent to me. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on this, import it, and now it shows up over here in my project panel as an audio file. So what I can do is actually just drag this into my scene, and I'll see that the waveform is now showing up down here. But the problem is I don't have the mouse shapes yet, right? It's still, uh, if, I play, if I were to play this back, it's going to do the audio just fine, but the mouth isn't going to match. So there's one extra step that I have to take for this, and that is to select your character, go to Timeline, Compute Lip Sync Take from Scene Audio. That is gonna analyze that audio track, and now look what happened. All the mouth shapes are showing up down here, and I can see all the different visemes that are associated with it. And they were automatically computed just as, as if I was recording live right here. So either method is completely valid. Uh, personally, I probably use this method a lot more um, because I am doing my audio in other programs. I'm editing it out. I'm taking out the ums and ahs and all of that. Or I get my friends who are really talented to do uh, use their voice talents and bring them in to kind of fuel my characters that way. So. Either way works, whatever's best for you, you have a few different options. Now I can layer over top of that. So let's go back to the beginning. I can drag the little playhead all the way back or I can click this icon over here to go to start and that's gonna take it back to the zero zero position. And then I can disarm lip sync and say, all right, now I'm just gonna focus on the face. And I probably, once I'm done with the audio, I can turn the lip sync off here because if I keep this on, if I keep the microphone on, it's just gonna keep giving me more waveforms. Um, even though lip sync isn't showing up and the, the mouth shapes won't show up, it will keep showing waveforms and I don't need those. So I'm just gonna turn that off for now. Then I can do the head motions based off of what I'm hearing. So I'm going to press record, listen to the, uh, the audio track, and then do certain mannerisms back and forth based off what I'm hearing uh, said something like that, and then press spacebar again when I'm done. And what did that do? That created a face take over top of this, and now the face and the lip sync are happening together. And now I can just keep going and doing, you know, here's my eye gaze, and I'm just gonna do my eyes. Now, if you twirl open eye gaze, there's actually some really cool things you can do here. So not only can you control it with camera input, but if I disarmed camera input and did mouse and touch input, then as I click and drag with the mouse, 
I can decide which way I want the eyes to go. And that just gives me a little bit of additional control, which is nice. Or I could do keyboard input. And now when I press the arrow keys, up, down, left, right, or two at the same time to do more diagonals, I have that as an option too. So with some of these parameters, you can arm them either with live camera data or with other things embedded in there. And so if let's say I wanted to do a keyboard only take, um, probably you only want one of these at a time, otherwise you can get you know some, kind of some conflicts there. And then I press record, and now I'm just gonna do a pass where I do the eyes. Maybe I start here, and then look forward, and then to the side, and then like this, maybe up. And again, go through the whole process with the eyes, stop, and now I have an eye gaze take. Now for the arms, I'm gonna to choose to do the dragger behavior, and that's gonna allow me to drag them around. Um, typically, you're going to just want to press record and do the whole dragger performance. Uh, so if I just press record, I have my arms in a rest position, and then maybe I have her you know, wave at the beginning, put them back down, maybe make a gesture with this arm, something like that, another gesture with this arm, put it back down and stop. So I can see I get a take for both the left hand and the right hand down here. You know, typically that's the easiest way to do it, but if you wanna do more advanced stuff where you're saying, okay, I want the you know left hand to move and, and right hand both move at the same time like this, then there's more advanced stuff you can do. Maybe you want to record one arm at a time, so I could do something where I you know just record this arm moving and do a take, and then go back and just record this arm moving and do each take separately. Um, there's You can get really complicated with this stuff. I'd say for starters, just keep it simple, and then you can always graduate to the more advanced stuff if you want. And then finally, let's end with triggers. Um, and so I will just look at my triggers here and say, you know, what are some of the things that I want her to do? So maybe I'll, you know, press record and focus on the eyes. And so maybe she starts like this and then they open a little bit and then they get back. And then maybe they're open again and back like that and stop. And that's one trigger pass. So here I've got, you know, it says down here, I can see no lid when the lid is disappeared and then it goes back to its default position when there's a gap there. Now I can go back and focus on something else, like maybe the hand positions. Like I notice, um, you know, a few times she's doing the gesture, her, her thumb would probably be facing the other way during that gesture. So I probably wanna trigger that. So let's go back here, press record. And I'm just gonna focus on that, that arm for that one position. Let's bring it up like that. Click it again when it goes down. I think the same is true of that hand like that. And now I can see where those particular triggers are happening. So you can start to see you're building up this kind of vertical timeline of all the different takes that you are layering on top of each other. Now let's talk a little bit about the editing process. So ideally you get everything right the first time, every recorded take is great and you're ready to go. But typically that's not how it goes. You may see little mistakes or things you wanna fix. And luckily Character Animator has a lot of tools that allow you to fix things in the timeline. So one of those is you can actually have multiple performances and kind of merge them together to feel like it's all one performance when in fact it might be multiple performances stitched together. I'll show you what I mean. So let's say here I decide that I want her to you know, tilt her head a slightly different way. So what I can do is select my character, uh, arm it here with the red dot, then turn everything off except for face. And now I'm just gonna kind of rotate my head to the side like this, click record, do a very short recording like this, and then stop. All right, so what that did is create a second take over top of my previous take. And now I see that this short two second like fix that I did is showing up over top of that original track that I recorded. And what I can do to make this a little bit smoother, you see right now the transition is really jerky. It doesn't look that great. What I can do is select this new take that's appearing above the other one and see these little uh, squares that appear in the upper corner. What I can do is drag over top of them and basically blend one performance into the next. So when you know the blend handle is at its lowest, it means this is still taking full control. And when it's at its highest over here, it means now this new one is taking over. And now I should actually see a nice smooth transition between those two states. So, to, and, and same with the out right there. So typically, if I do a recording, I'm gonna record just a bass track, just do my basic, you know, here's my face movements, 
and I'm gonna go back and make little adjustments and changes by recording additional takes and then blending them in to make it all look like one seamless performance. Now you can also edit the lip sync. Typically the auto lip sync is gonna work really well most of the time, but maybe there's a time where it picks up the wrong uh, mouth shape or you wanna accentuate a certain part. So you have full control and editability over these visims as well. So if I go to this uh mouth shape and I say, you know what, that was really an F sound instead. What I can actually do is right click this and select what mouth shape I want it to be. So let's say this was an F shape and immediately I see she goes to that mouth. And if I wanted this to start a little bit later or earlier, I can drag that as well. Um, I have full control over that. Or if I want it to be silent, I can right click it and click silence and that's gonna create a gap right there and just go back to her neutral mouth shape instead. So you have full control over the, that lip sync and if you wanted to do everything manually or fix everything, you can absolutely do that and Character Animator gives you those tools. Triggers is another area where you have a lot of flexibility in the editing process. So here I recorded you know, this part where she doesn't have her lids, her, uh, she does the full eye uh, treatment. And if I wanted this to happen a little bit later or earlier, I can of course drag this around, I can trim it, I can do whatever I want with it um, to change the duration and the timing of it to get it just right. In fact, I can add additional triggers if I just go here and right click and say, okay, I want a new no lid here. And then I get a new trigger down here that I can add as well. So with triggers, as long as you record it once, you can actually just right click and add new ones or delete them or change the timing. Um, so you don't have to keep re-recording with triggers. You can kind of just play around with them in the timeline and get all that timing exactly right. Now, if this trigger was part of a swap set, which are those ones where it only shows one trigger at a time, um, like the hand positions, for example, you have some further options there too. So this one was the hand flip, but actually if I right click on this, I have all the options of the different triggers that were available in that swap set. So if I wanted to change it to a point instead, I could do that. It doesn't look that great upside down, so I probably don't want that. Or go back to the default or stick with the flip. So you may run into uh, certain trigger swap sets where you have a huge list of things you can change between and have a lot of different options. So again, do your initial recording and then you can dig in and right click and move things around, change the duration, ch change the timing and get it working exactly like you want. So now that I've got my timing down, my edits are looking good, I'm ready to export. I can just go up here to the upper right corner, the share icon up here, click on that and choose video via Adobe Media Encoder. You have a few different options down here that you can play around with, um, but for the purposes of today, I just want a simple video that I can post on you know, social media or YouTube or whatever. So I'm gonna go this route, so I'm gonna select that. So you'll go through a little prompt that'll ask you where you wanna save it, what you wanna name it as all that stuff, and then it'll be put in your queue here. Um, and so all you have to do to get things started is press this green play button up here, start the queue, and that's gonna start rendering out your performance. And you'll see a little preview of it down here. Um, it should happen pretty quickly. And now you have an MP4 file that's ready for uploading to whatever destination you want. And you can of course play this back and review it and do whatever else you want with it. So that's the basic walkthrough of creating a character animator short form cartoon. You bring in your puppet, you do your performance either all at once live or build it up piece by piece until you get it right make some edits, blend in some takes, edit the visims and the triggers and all of that, and then export it out as a video file. But there's one more thing I wanna end with, and that is the ability to bring Character Animator into other Adobe video programs, specifically Adobe Premiere Pro and Adobe After Effects. This is where there's a ton of additional power of what you can do with Character Animator because if you already know how to use those programs, you can add Character Animator into your workflow and bring these characters into your video compositions, motion graphics pieces, cartoons, whatever sort of thing you wanna do. So the first thing I'm gonna do is select my forest layer down here at my background in the timeline and press delete. I don't want that anymore because I want whatever's showing up behind my puppet just to show up without uh, you know trees blocking it, right? And so remember, this is just a transparent background. So that's all I have to do. Now I'm completely done with the character animator part and I'm gonna go open up Premiere Pro and see what I can do. All right, so I'm here in Premiere Pro and I have a video of this Lego treehouse uh, that I want my character to narrate over top of. 
So what I can do is import my character animator project and it's just gonna show up as any other piece of footage um, with a transparent background. So I'm gonna go ahead and go to File, Import, and I'm going to find my CH proj file that I was using. In this case, I knew it was character animator project 10.ch proj and go ahead and import that. That's the main character animator project uh, with all the recordings and stuff. So I click import and this brings up the dynamic link window. So I can just select the scene that I want. Usually if you just have one scene, this is easy. If you have multiple scenes, you wanna select the correct one. And I'm gonna go ahead and click okay. Now my character is showing up here as a piece of footage. And what I can do is just drag her into the timeline over here. And now she's just showing up over top of the footage itself. And so I could select her, maybe go to my effect controls over here. Let's change her positioning to be, you know, to the side, something like that, where she's kind of narrating from the corner. And now I have a cartoon narrator who's talking about my Lego tree house. Uh, and I've just integrated her that easy. And this is the best part about dynamic link is there's no additional rendering step. Um, I don't have to like export out the video file. If I made a change in the original character emitter document, let's say I, you know, changed when the triggers of her eyes were, or I adjusted one of her dragger movements or something like that, it's just automatically gonna update. And when I open this project or come back to this project again, it's just gonna show that change. So this makes for a really nice workflow. So the exact same thing is true in Adobe After Effects. Here, I've got a composition that I wanna add my animated character talking in front of. So I can just, again, go to File, Import, File, again, find that character animator project file, CH proj file, go ahead and open it up. Again, that gives me the dynamic link window. I'm gonna select my scene and click OK. And now she shows up as another asset over here in my project panel. And so I can just drag her in. And just like Premiere Pro, I've got her here and I could, you know, rescale her, do whatever I want. And now she's just gonna play back exactly like uh, I recorded. And again, any changes that I made in the recording uh, in Character Animator will just automatically show up here without any additional rendering step. So there it is, creating a simple cartoon in Character Animator and all the cool stuff that you can do with it. Um, hopefully this was a great overview. And if you wanna dig deeper into any subject, there are plenty of videos uh, doing just that. If you wanna make your own characters from PSD or AI files, if you wanna dig deeper into the recording process or body tracking or letting your character walk or do head turns or all sorts of stuff, it's all out there. So hopefully this got you interested and willing to try a little bit more. And uh, if you have any questions, the best place to get help is the official character animator forums. So if you're running into problems, ask there and someone from the team or community can help you out. And if you make anything really cool with Character Animator, we would love to see it. So please use hashtag Character Animator when sharing on social media so we can take a look and find it. All right, that's it for today. Thank you so much for watching and have fun.